Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another installment of uh, these Urban Forestry Education Webinar Series. Uh, funding for this project is provided by New York State's Environmental Protection Fund and is administered by the Urban and Community Forestry Program in DEC's Lands and Forests. Um, I'd just like to bring up a couple of webinars we have coming up. Um, next week on June 3rd, that's Wednesday at one o'clock, we have a presentation by Andy Hillman of, Daisy Re of Davy Resource Group on growing uh, big trees in the city. And then the following week on June 11th at one o'clock, uh, we have a presentation on urban tree pests and diseases that will be presented by Dan Gilrain of Cornell Co Cooperative Extension Suffolk County and Marjorie Daughtry of Cornell University. Um, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone to uh, save all questions for the end of the presentation. Please use the Q&A option to submit questions. Um, you can use the chat for any, uh, uh, for any comments or if you're having any issues, uh, you can use the chat, we will monitor that. Um, there will be a couple of polls we will bring up in this presentation, so we'll allow for some time to answer those and share the results. Um, ISA CU credits are available for this presentation. Um, please submit your name and ISA number in the chat at the end of the presentation. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Andrew Ullman of Daisy, Davy Resource Group. Andrew Ullman is a project developer with Davy Resource Group. He's primarily responsible for sales projects in the New York City region. Andrew has nearly 20 years of experience in arboriculture and urban forestry. Prior to joining Davy Resource Group, he served as the director at Brooklyn Forestry with the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. Prior to that, he worked as a practicing arborist climbing and caring for trees in the Pacific Northwest with his tree service, Cascadia Tree Preservation. Andrew joined Davy Resource Group in March of 2019. He's an ISA certified arborist and holds the ISA track credential. Andrew has a master's degree in arboriculture and urban forestry from the University of Central Lancaster in the United Kingdom. He earned his bachelor's degree from the Evergreen State University and holds an associate's degree in urban tree management from Paul Smith's College. Andy, uh, Andrew, welcome. And I'll let you uh, take over from there. Hey, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you. Um, you know, as I said, thanks, Kevin, and to the rest of the team from uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, in the, uh, Nassau County. There. Um, also, want to extend my thanks to New York State DEC for funding these educational series and uh, making these possible. Um, I'm here today to talk about tree inventories and urban forest management plans. Um, this is intended to serve as a primer uh, on this, this subject. You know, we can't, we certainly can't uh, cover a uh, master's or a doctoral level thesis or dissertation in an hour here. Uh, but my hope is that all of you find at least something useful and learn a little something uh, during this webinar. Um, so yeah, thank you again for hosting and uh, with that I'll get started. So why the heck would anybody spend time inventorying trees? Um, I know when I'm meeting folks for the first time or getting to know acquaintances better um, and talking about what an urban forester actually does, I often get these the raised eyebrow look or a bit of a blank stare when I talk about inventorying trees and, and managing urban forests. Um, so, you know, I thought it would be useful to put together a presentation on this. Um, so with that, uh, let's, let's get into it. Um, I do want to say, you know, before we get into it, I want to cover a couple, um, couple things first. I'd like to kind of talk about the definition of urban forestry and community forestry, uh, particularly as it relates to this presentation. And then I'd like to build a little context for why tree inventories are important and why urban forest management plans are, are important, particularly uh, in the times we find ourselves living in. So um, let's, let's get going. So what is an urban or community forest? 
Um, you know, I think these terms are can often be used synonymously, um, but in my mind, there is there is a difference that's often um, based on, on the locale that we're talking about. Um, a community forest is usually a more appropriate term when we're talking about towns and villages, hamlets, things like that, um, versus urban forests, which are, are usually just that. We're, we're talking about more densely urban places, cities, um, where the human population is, is more dense. Um, the U.S. Forest Service defines the urban forests as the urban parks, street trees, landscaped boulevards, gardens, river and coastal promenades, greenways, river corridors, wetlands, nature preserves, shelter belts of trees, and working trees at former industrial sites. I think that's a pretty thorough uh, uh, definition of it, but I usually like to sum it up by saying basically it's all the plants, and particularly the trees growing in a developed area. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the difference or, or the way we typically sort of uh, bucket trees in an urban forest between the public trees and the private trees. Um, the publicly owned trees are typically those in parks and natural areas, the public right of way, which is usually our street trees, uh, trees growing on public property, so you know our town hall, city hall, schools, that type of thing, uh, versus the private trees, which are typically um, those growing on private property, residences, commercial and industrial sites. Um, and you know, when we say urban forest, we're usually talking about the both of those combined. But I think it's important to differentiate um, because while we certainly try to manage urban forests in their entirety, um, local governments, municipalities, or, or any uh, entities uh, responsible for managing trees typically are um, doing maintenance and, and that type of management on trees on public properties um, and covering private trees in certain instances with ordinances, regulation, that kind of thing. Um, but I, but I said again, I think it's important to you know draw that distinction because um, you know we're not often able to um, you know have one entity maintain both both of those uh, groupings of trees. So I would like to pivot here and move away from now that we've covered the definition um, to kind of build a little context and talk about why inventories and man and proactive management via urban forest management plans is so so important right now. Um, and I'd like to start by by discussing this idea that or you know looking at the phenomenon of, of these human population shifts that we've seen over the last hundred plus years where we're moving from um, more agrarian societies to urbanization, industrialization, and seeing our um, our population densities move um, to cities and urban areas. We now know that you know more than half of the world's population live in urban areas, and that's coming up on four billion people. In the U.S. alone, we're talking more than 80 percent of the population living in urbanized areas. Um, this number is projected to grow worldwide, and that. Uh, often means that street trees and urban parks are the closest access people have to the natural world. Um, so let's keep that in mind and then add to it that we know trees provide critical ecosystem services. Um, we know they reduce air pollution, mitigate stormwater, sequester carbon. Uh, properly planted trees and located trees can help us reduce energy consumption. There are a lot of studies um, which draw a link between trees and the natural world and human health and well-being, as well as providing habitat for wildlife. Um, so when we couple the population shifts we're seeing with these ecosystem services and think about it in the context of the impacts of climate change that we're expecting, we're already seeing and expected to continue to see um, we start to see a picture of why proactively managing our trees is becoming increasingly important. Um, something else I want to talk about 
in this, the context of urbanization is protecting public safety. Um, you know, as more people begin to live more close together and closer to trees, and um, we, uh, you know, lead this charge to grow more and bigger trees in our cities, protecting public safety becomes increasingly important. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, you know, as, as later on in the talk here. So I know uh, most of you are probably not planning to have to do any math during this talk. And I, I promise for those of you who, um, like myself, are not necessarily uh, the greatest at math, this one will be easy. Just want to put a bow on this, you know, the context we're building here. Um, again, the, the general population trends globally and certainly here in the U.S., coupled with the expected impacts of climate change and the known ecosystem services that we have no trees provide and are now and are able to quantify, um, we arrive at an understanding that we have a critical need to proactively manage our urban forests. So you will remember this slide. Um, now that we've gone through the definitions and built some context here, let's get into it. Why would anybody spend time inventorying trees? Um, so I want to pivot here on that with, with asking, well, what's the first step in proactively managing an urban forest? Well, you probably won't be surprised to hear that it's a tree inventory. Um, a tree inventory serves as the foundation for proactively managing your community's vital resource, trees. Um, we need to, you need to know what you have before you can effectively manage a resource. You've got to have that baseline established before you can begin to uh, plot your course and figure out what you'd like to do and, and what you need to do. Um, so let's look at a little more of the specifics um, about why would we perform an inventory. Well, as I just said, you know, we need to establish that baseline in order to effectively manage a resource. Um, you can use the data that you've collected throughout the inventory to get an understanding of where you stand and use that to make data-driven decisions to begin to set your urban forest management goals. Additionally, you can use this data to begin establishing budgets and work planning. Um, for example, you can start to identify um, how many trees, uh, let's say for example, that are you've identified as a priority for needing to be pruned or how many trees you'd like to plant. And um, with that number, this will allow you to start moving forward with establishing your budgets and you know, again, charting your course to plan out this work, whatever your priorities that you've identified may end up being. Um, and you know, as I touched on a little bit earlier, you can also use this information to guide your tree risk management programs and protect public safety. Um, you know, we, we unfortunately don't live in a world where you can just walk into, uh, say, your mayor's office or, or you know, the budget office for your um, community and say, I need a million dollars to do what we'd like to do with our urban forestry program. Um, it doesn't work that way. So, um, you know, prioritizing your work through the lens of public safety is one way to go. The inventory will allow you to identify the trees and their location um, that pose the greatest risk to public safety and allow you to address those in the most efficient manner and utilize your budget most efficiently. Um, another important thing that can be done is um, guiding your tree planting programs and addressing any issues of environmental justice that may exist within your community. Um, we know that historically around the world, neighborhoods in wealthier parts of the city are often those that have the highest canopy cover um, and that you know, underserved and poorer areas are typically have fewer trees. Well, your inventory will allow you to identify and map those areas and begin to proactively target your planting um, to address these, these types of issues. Um, and, and, you know, as I mentioned before, when advocating for your funding, 
we unfortunately can't just walk in and say, um, this is how much I need, thank you very much, and be on your way. Um, you know, you, you have to have sound justification to advocate for your program and utilizing the data that you've collected during your inventory is a great starting point for doing that. It will help you understand um, where you are currently and what, you, you know, what your highest priorities are in your urban forest as it stands now, as well as begin to look toward the future and figure out where you'd like to go and how to advocate for that. So I'd also like to quickly cover, you know, who's typically having inventories performed. Um, you know, a lot of the time it's government agencies, um, both, you know, local, uh, county, state, federal, um, anybody who's, who's managing the larger populations of trees, tree advisory boards, um, nonprofits, land trusts and such, um, colleges and universities are another big one, often, um, tasked with and concerned for protecting the safety of their students, faculty and staff, and basically anybody visiting the campus. Um, same for golf courses, arboretums, you know, we're looking at commercial campuses and HOAs are another big one, um, looking to proactively um, mitigate risk as well as um, improve the health and function of their urban forest. Um, so I'd like to pause here and um, we'll put up our first poll here um, just to get a sense for where folks are at on the webinar with inventories in their own communities. Um, the poll is up. Um, well, it looks like it put both questions up. Um, so yeah, I'll leave this up for a, a minute or so. Um, if you want to say in the, in the chat um, what a municipality or entity you're from, uh, please feel free to do that. Um, so you can see the kind of representation we've got um, going on here in the webinar. Okay. We can uh, give it a few more seconds here. Okay, so it looks like about half of you have had inventories um, and the other half either haven't or perhaps aren't sure. Um, and I, you know, for those of you who haven't had one, um, I, I hope, uh, you know, again, that this, this, uh, this webinar is, provides some really useful information for you. Um, we, I will post some additional resources at the end and this webinar is also being recorded, so um, you'll be able to go back and refer to it uh, if, um, if you would like to revisit any of this. Okay, so I think, um, thanks for that, and uh, we'll keep rolling here. Um, so now I'd like to get into a little bit of the um, you know, the, the specifics of how inventories and how data is actually collected during inventories. Um, I will start by saying, you know, these are the two main ways it's being done now. Um, there is, um, you know, technology being applied to tree inventories in new ways with um, machine learning and the like, but um, it isn't terribly widely used just yet. I think it's still mostly in the development phase. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to stick to just talking about analog and computerized um, data collection these days. Um, so when we're talking about analog inventory data collection, it's, it's simple paper lists, and maps, um, simple spreadsheets being used to build a basic database versus computerized where um, the inventory arborist is in the field with a tablet or a handheld device. Um, they're typically GPS locating um, you know, creating GIS layers with the inventory uh, and starting with using aerial maps or, or ortho photos. Um, now, before I get into the pros and cons of each of those, I just want to talk a little bit about 
the levels of inspections that are typically done during an inventory. Um, and these, you know, according, these are level one, two, and three are basically the industry standard levels of inspection. Um, level one is a limited ground-based visual assessment. Sometimes they're referred to as a windshield assessment uh, because they are often a drive-by where uh, the person is assessing the trees at a rapid pace, looking at them from one side, um, and just looking for any really glaring defects. A level two is a um, much more common level of inspection during inventories, wherein the inventory arborist or a person conducting the inventory is actually walking the ground and conducting a 360 degree ground-based visual evaluation of the entire tree, looking at the root flare, the trunk, and the upper crown, um, to assess condition, the health of the tree, looking for defects. Um, and then lastly, level three is, um, can be triggered from a level two inspection if the person doing the level two um, is unable to determine the severity or extent of a particular defect, for example, a cavity or dead wood, um, they may call for a level three inspection, which is a more advanced level and um, will include aerial inspections, uh, the use of decay detection equipment through drilling resistance or sonic tomography and uh, root crown examinations to really work hard to um, determine, again, the severity or extent of any defect that uh, they may be seeing. Um, typical data fields that we expect to normally see collected during an inventory um, genus and species are really uh, one of the most important ones. With that, you can begin to uh, understand the composition of your urban forest and use, use that data to begin to understand um, how your urban forest stands um, when it comes to diversity or lack thereof and um, you know, whether or not Let's, let's talk about lack of diversity if your urban forest is particularly exposed to um, pests or diseases. Um, we, we know that you know, um, a lack of diversity can have some very serious consequences when we look into the past at uh, chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease, uh, more currently where many of us are facing problems from emerald ash borer, and your inventory will allow you to get a broader picture of what you're looking at and the proportions or percentages um, that each genus or species makes up of your urban forest. Again, to allow you to make data-driven decisions on the best way to manage your larger tree populations. You're also gonna be collecting uh, location, uh, the address if it's appropriate, um, X and Y coordinates when you're using GPS, to allow you to drop a tree point everywhere that you are inventorying a tree to understand its, um, you know, and have an accurate geolocation of it. You're also normally collecting tree size uh, represented by diameter. Uh, sometimes it's important to collect multi-stem trees to understand, um, you know, tree architecture and, and sort of predict any potential failures in the future. Collecting condition is another important one to help you build a picture of your urban forest's overall health, as well as obviously the individual tree's um, condition. But once you have completed an inventory, you can um, get a better understanding of the overall health of your urban forest and whether you have and get a picture of how many of your trees are in good condition, uh, fair condition, poor, how many dead trees do you have out there? Um, you can also begin to get an understanding for any maintenance needs you may need. During the inventory, you will visit the tree and see that, um, you know, perhaps you have some building clearance needs, road clearance, or there is some dead wood in the tree that should be cleaned out. Another important one is vacant planting sites. Um, this becomes important for communities that are looking to expand and increase their urban forest. Um, this, is, this is the baseline data 
for building your planting programs. Um, you need to understand how many vacant sites you have, whether they will um, you know, be appropriate for trees that are going to get large at maturity, medium, small. Um, so I find that, that at least some proportion of your inventory um, is it's really critical to collect those planting sites. Um, getting a picture for the defects that any given tree may have. And this, this rolls into the next bullet of tree risk assessment and rating. You know, um, unfortunately, we, we don't often have all of the money that we need to um, fund our, fully fund our urban forest management programs. And, um, you know, of course, this is not a problem exclusive to urban forestry, um, but when collect, you know, doing tree risk assessment and understanding the state of your urban forest, you can begin to most efficiently use the limited resources that you may have. You can understand where your trees that present the highest risk are specifically located and begin to target those um, you know, in the interest of protecting public safety. You can locate and identify trees that maybe are a high priority for removal or perhaps need to have um, some pruning done quickly to mitigate that risk. Um, and again, having this can help you um, most efficiently use the limited resources that you may be dealing with. Um, residual risk is another one, and it can be looked at, um, in a, or, or I should, should say, it can be collected. You know, either during the initial inspection, um, you will assign a residual risk rating with the assumption that work to mitigate the defect and the risk that you have identified will be mitigated. So, for example, that dead limb will be removed, and when it's removed, this is the residual risk. Um, you know, and that can be done at the time of inspection or um, as a follow-up post-work inspection as well. Further inspection is another one um, that is, is linked to the level three inspection I mentioned. If during the initial inventory data collection, there is a defect that um, you can't fully assess during a level two inspection, you may identify it for further inspection um, to trigger that level three inspection. Overhead utilities is another common one. Um, you know, often this comes into play uh, both for planting programs and um, helps you get a better understanding of maintenance that may be involved when larger trees were historically planted under overhead lines. Um, but nowadays, you know, often we'll, when, when looking to plant under them, we will plant smaller or medium-sized trees to really lower the likelihood of um, interference with those overhead utilities in the future, um, which is a win both for the utility um, and, and reducing likelihood of any service interruptions due to tree failure, but also lowers the maintenance um, required to work on trees around those overhead utilities. And oftentimes it's just better for the trees too. <laughs> um, and date of inventory is, is a, you know, it's a pretty straightforward one because, you know, these inventories need to be updated. Uh, urban forests and trees are, of course, biological organisms that grow and change over time. Um, so you'll, you'll need to have that. And then lastly, um, some communities like to collect hardscape damage, um, basically sidewalk damage due to tree roots. Um, if they have a budget to um, fix some of those sidewalks, it's important to identify those locations. So now that we've covered that, um, I'd like to spend a little time talking about some of the pros and cons of the two different uh, data collection types I mentioned. When, when it comes to analog, um, you know, paper and pen and paper maps, you know, some of the pros are that they're comparatively inexpensive and they're, they're usually relatively easy to perform um, and with a lower bar to entry. Um, but, you know, they're not usually suitable for larger tree populations. Um, it, it's just, it becomes very cumbersome to be collecting hundreds, if not thousands of trees while handwriting these things down on paper. Um, additionally, there's a limited ability to collate and process that data versus, you know, data that's collected in a computer 
and you know the, the filtering and sorting and the types of things that, that you're able to do even if it is collected in a simple database um, but you know i would add to that it also requires manual input into management or analysis software if you are moving beyond a, a simple database and um, inputting this into um, some of the, the existing software um, or analysis software such as iTree, um, it's cumbersome and time consuming to manually input these things in. And um, I would also point to that the, the location of trees can be less accurate when you are estimating your location on a paper map and, and um, dropping and um, plotting your, your a tree in that way. When it comes to computerized, um, you know, some of the pros is that it, it allows for more rapid data collection of larger tree populations. Um, you can usually move pretty quickly and collect everything you need. You, you already have all the fields preloaded with drop down menus, and you know, it allows you to cover quite a lot of ground pretty quickly. Um, additionally, it's much easier to input it into management or analysis software. It's usually you know, simply uploading or a data dump in there and boom, you're, you're good to go. Um, and even easier if you're collecting it directly into management software. Um, and, it, and it often allows for a more accurate geolocation um, because you're, you know, you, you're identifying yourself uh, via GPS on the map and you know you're next to the tree. Um, so it can often be a more accurate uh, location there. That said, um, these, these often do require certain technical skills. Um, you know, and while I would say it's, it's, it's not always rocket science, as the saying goes, um, it's, it's not necessarily intuitive. Um, you need to have the hardware and the technical skills to be able to do these, um, which means they can have a, a higher bar to entry. And typically there are higher costs associated with it because, um, you know, for these reasons, you know, there's hardware involved, there is a lot of back end work done on it. Um, and so there are, you know, there are some, some challenges to that. And each project is specific. And, um, you know, depending on the size and scope of the project will guide you in which, which type of data collection works best for you. Uh, I want to spend a little time talking about managing your inventory data with software. Um, you know, as I've said, this helps you understand your urban forest composition and software allows you to do that rather quickly. Once your inventory is collected, all the data has been input, quality control has been performed, and you're up and running. You know, with the push of a few buttons, you can understand your composition, you can understand the health, and quickly generate, um, uh, you know, reports to tell you how many ash trees you have, how many elms you have, what are the conditions, how many trees do you have, regardless of species, in poor condition or dead. Um, you can identify higher risk trees to, again, prioritize your resources. Um, you can very easily generate reports to say, how many trees do I have in the high and extreme risk categories and target those trees for, um, you know, use prioritizing with the resources that you have on hand. You can also identify vacant planting sites. Presuming those were collected during the inventory, you can simply filter for vacant planting sites. Um, you know, let's say you have a certain budget for planting each year, you would like to target your large planting sites um, for the next two to three planting seasons or however it may work for you. Well, very easy to generate a report to help you identify those planting sites, where they are. Um, you can filter them by um, parts of your community. If you want to target certain neighborhoods or certain areas, um, you know, software can be a very powerful tool to help you do any number of these things. Um, and, you know, as I've said, you can also use it to um, manage your response to any pests and diseases. Many communities are using it to, um, to manage their um, treatments for Dutch elm disease, for EAB, for Asian longhorn beetle, and whatever it may be. This software, again, serves as a very powerful tool to allow you to identify and manage um, 
as efficiently as possible. Um, this I just wanted to go over quickly, just for those of you who are not familiar with or haven't used software before, this is commonly what it will look like. You can see my mouse cursor here. This is a tree point. When you click on that, it will open up a box here and help you identify the species, what diameter, um, any notes, things like that. And, um, you know, there are different ways to view it. But um, just to give you a quick sense for what it looks like when you're using it. Um, so I also want to point to, you know, software allowing you to, you know, the, the power of it will allow you to, um, if you are a municipality, track incoming service requests. You can record every inspection you've ever done on a particular tree, which is important um, both for legal reasons as well as monitoring tree health. Um, Let's say you've identified a particular tree that you would like to monitor over time, and you will be able to record these inspections each time and look back to see, is the tree getting better? Is it continuing to decline? Um, so it can be a really great monitoring tool in that way. You can also use it to create work orders and track work history, um, generate work orders to give to field crews, send them out with, and, um, you know, there's a couple different ways that those can be managed. Some communities bring, send out, you know, paper work orders and come back and data is input at the end of the day to mark what was done. Um, many software will allow you to make those updates in the field, either on a smartphone or a tablet. Um, and basically what it will do is allow you to maintain a record of all of your service histories. You know, as we said, the service requests, inspections, work orders, and such. Additionally, it, it can be a really powerful tool for reporting and work tracking. Um, you'll, you'll see in the leftmost column here, you can identify any project you want um, and begin to manage your budget that way. It, it can be a really great tool and make things much easier than um, perhaps they were in the past. And, um, now, this is just a quick way of looking at that, but um, you know, as I've said, these can be really powerful tools for helping you most effectively and efficiently manage the resources you have. Um, another another thing I wanted to talk about, you know, as far as budgeting, um, this will be software will allow you to uh, manage these budgets um, again by neighborhood or community board ward, however your communities are, you know chosen to, to identify the, the various different sections. Um, you can allocate funding to each of them, understand the composition of them. So in this example, um, for Ward 1, we know we found there were two extreme or high risk removals, nine extreme or high risk prunings, and um, you know it, it, it becomes a very useful tool for um, identifying and recording the way your response to this. Another thing um, that I want to point to when it comes to what um, you know what you can get out of your inventory is urban forest benefit analysis. Um, you know, typically iTree, which in this slide you know, is, is um, what we've used to generate these benefits, um, we can get an understanding of how much carbon our, our urban forest is sequestering, um, any number of those ecosystem services that I talked about. Um, and you can do it from one tree up to your entire urban forest to really get a, a good handle on exactly how much work your urban forest is doing for you. Um, I think we all know that trees do their work quietly and they aren't really able to brag about themselves about <laughs> how much work they're doing for us. Um, so it's sometimes, you know, it can get overlooked for, for people who aren't necessarily um, directly keyed into urban forestry or, our, or, bar, or boriculture. Um, but this is a great way to help illustrate, well, first to quantify and then to illustrate exactly what that is and put it in a dollar amount, which is a language that we all understand. Um, you know, we're often told that money doesn't grow on trees, but um, I'm, I'm not so sure that's actually true. <laughs> Um, you know, again, using iTree, we can quantify the benefits and values of our, our trees. 
And, you know, it's a great suite of tools. It, 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 there are a lot of different things that, um, you know, we can do with iTree. Um, iTree Eco is the tool that's most often used um, and allows us to do functional analyses, um, understanding pollution removal and human health impacts, how much carbon and our, our trees are sequestering and storing for us, uh, stormwater mitigation and the, the broader hydrology effects, any building energy effects, uh, you know, again, the pest risk analysis. Um, these, are, these are different tools um, that can really help us get a, a fuller picture of exactly what it is our urban forest is doing for us. So um, here I'm gonna pivot from the inventory now to talk a little bit more about management plans. Um, so we've, we've, we've done our inventory. And now, now what? Um, well, for tree nerds like myself and those of us managing trees, urban forests, and cities, I think this is where this is where you know it can get even more interesting. Um, we've done the inventory, and now we know what we have. Um, I like this graphic because it it helps us kind of illustrate how we can leverage our inventory and to create an urban forest management plan beginning with um, you know, utilizing adaptive management and beginning with what do we have? Well, we've done the inventory and now we know that. We've established our baseline. We understand the picture of where we stand today and they can begin to allow us to figure out what we want um, and identify where we're doing well, perhaps where we have uh, room to get better, um, and then we can build a plan and begin to devise a roadmap for how we get there. Um, and then beyond that, um, you know, we can, we can make set measurable goals so that we can um, analyze what we've done and how we're doing um, to understand what's working, what's not, do we need to reconfigure um, what we're thinking and how we're approaching things. Um, but this is a really great, um, framework to work within when managing your urban forest. Um, so, you know, continuing on this theme and, and getting a little more into developing an urban forest management plan, um, I'm going to pause here for a moment and we're going to do our second poll here um, just to get a sense for where everybody in the audience stands in relation to um, management plans. Um, so, uh, some of them, I think both polls went up uh, last time, but um, I'll put it up again. Looks like some already, some of them already answered this one. Uh, well, actually, right, if, you're, if you're gonna a, answer, a just, second, you should be able to pick poll two. I, there should be a second one. Okay, I didn't realize there were two questions in each poll. All right, sorry about that. Here comes the uh, next poll. Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds here. Um, okay, so it looks like, uh, you know, as with, with the inventories, we're about uh, split 50-50 here. Um, and, um, you know, this is useful information to have, I think, for, for all of us to kind of understand where, where we're at and, um, you know, collectively as, as, as um, and, and understand maybe where we where we have room for growth, and you know that um, you know in in some areas we're actually doing quite well. So I think we'll uh, close this poll here um, and uh, move on here. Um, so you know, getting into a little bit more of the specifics about urban forest management plans, um, sometimes called community forest management plans. It, it it's a roadmap for proactive maintenance of the urban forest. 
and um, it provides a tailor a plan that's tailored to a specific community and designed expressly to facilitate proactive and effective management while simultaneously maximizing the long-term benefits provided to the community. Um, and I, I want to, uh, you know, stick on the uh, focus on the, the tailored to a specific community um, because these management plans are built off of the data collected during the inventory. Um, so, you know, we have, once this inventory has been collected, you have this picture I've been talking about in, in, in a more comprehensive understanding of the current state of your urban forest. And from there, you can begin to build this, this plan tailored for your community. Um, what, you know, using this adaptive management framework we talked about before, you know, as I just said, these can provide guidance for your managing your urban forest, um, allow you to establish and track your long and short-term goals using these principles. Um, and, and, you know, these are important because they promote a shared vision, excuse me, amongst the uh, people responsible for managing the urban forest um, and those tasked with um, taking care of the broader urban forest for the community. Um, it allows you to communicate the value and the benefit that each trees are providing provided that the analysis has been done and um, you know, help bring a broader awareness uh, to the value that trees are providing um, and allows you to really dig in and manage the challenges that you're facing and the opportunities that have now been presented, um, you know, again, in a more comprehensive picture because of, of the data you've collected. Um, and, you know, as we've said, it, it really, what it does is um, establishes a pathway to achieve um, this proactive management as opposed to, um, you know, being stuck in the position where you simply have to react to um, either public service, exclusively public service requests or, you know, just waiting for things to happen. Um, you know, it allows this, this um, shift toward a mo more proactive um, way to get there. So um, just want to kind of go over, um, you know, again, provide a bit of a primer for what these, what these management plans look like. Um, you know, they of course begin with the acknowledgements and introduction. And I think the executive summaries often provide some very useful um, information in a, in a broader overview, giving you, um, you know, a, a broad vision for the state of, the exi of your existing urban forest, um, there will be an outline of maintenance recommendations based on the state of the forest and will also help highlight and identify program needs to help push your program forward. Um, and sometimes, you know, we need help with that and um, that's exactly what these, these, these plans are intended to do. So I just wanted to, you know, provide a quick example too. Um, this was uh, this was taken from Syracuse's Urban Forest Master Plan, and I need to um, take a moment to um, talk about the difference here between an urban forest management plan and an urban forest master plan. Um, Where you know, master plans could probably be an entire um, presentation in and of themselves. So, um, you know, while this was taken from the master plan, it still serves the purposes of our discussion about management plans very well. Um, and this provides uh, a broad overview from um, Syracuse, New York, um, the Davy Resource Group did an urban forest master plan for them. And I think this illustrates well um, what these types of plans do for communities um, to help provide this broad overview. And, use this data to begin building the framework for proactive management. Um, you know, it, it gives a number, you know, an understanding for how many trees we're talking about, the value of them, most common species, um, canopy cover, uh, as well as impervious surface cover. Um, you know, those, those, some of those are, are, are not typical to a management plan, um, specifically the impervious services. Um, but you know these annual benefits are another one that I really wanted to point out because these these are um, the types of uh, 
data you will see from an iTree analysis and get a, get a picture of what your urban forest productivity looks like. Um, moving beyond th that, um, some, some typical sections that we would see, you know, again, we're going to look at a more in-depth um, benefit uh, analysis of the trees beyond um, just the ecosystem services. You know, there will be addressing economic, social, and environmental aspects um, to, you know, take on a more, you know, these are the three main tenets of sustainability. So when, when applied to urban forestry, um, we get a sense for, uh, you know, begin to get a picture anyway of the sustainability of our urban forest. Um, there will be an inventory analysis. So the data collected during the inventory is, is analyzed and broken down um, to cover, you know, as I've said, diversity, size class distribution, general health, and then um, from there, allow you to build your management program. Um, you know, we discussed a little bit about priority maintenance versus proactive maintenance um, and kind of you know, waiting for things to happen um, versus proactively getting out there and working to improve the state of your urban forest. It can help you develop planting plans um, and maintenance schedules and budgets in one cohesive place so that you can refer to it and use it as the, um, the handbook, the guidance for moving your urban forest management program forward. Um, don't want to spend too much time on this, but just quickly wanted to, um, you know, again, cover the difference between management plans versus master plans because, um, you know, as I said, a master plan could be a, a, a whole talk in and of itself. But, um, you know, a management plan is often the public trees. Um, this is an inventory of your street and park trees um, and trees on other public properties versus under a master plan, you would have a full picture of the urban forest. Um, management plans are typically, you know, city or, or other municipal staff and with the goal of achieving a proactive maintenance program. Um, you can see that the time frame to build these plans is much shorter um, and the implementation, you know, they're typically need to be revised every five years is ideal. Um, and the cost estimates, you know, these are, uh, I want to caution, these are just estimates and the real costs are, are of course directly tied to um, the size of an urban forest we're talking about and the specific needs of any given community and what, what do they want, what's going to work best and serve them the best. Um, so I just wanted to spend a few moments talking about that, just the, that distinction there. Lastly, um, and I hope I don't confuse things here <laughs> in, in talking about master plans, but um, because you know the urban forest master plans are separate from city master plans, but um, I thought this was important to spend a few minutes talking about because um, you know as I was discussing in the beginning, um, all of this is couched in our efforts to mitigate the impacts of climate change in our urban areas and where the vast majority of our population is living. Um, you know, trees are unfortunately not the, the magic answer, so to speak, but we know they play a vital role and are really a, a keystone piece in the puzzle to um, finding a solution to the challenges we're facing. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that a little bit. Um, and lastly, um, I did want to, this is a graphic I really like to, um, to help illustrate um, an ideal continuum for, for um, urban forestry programs in communities. Um, you know, obviously we kind of, I started in the middle because the topic was posted, uh, focused on inventories and management, urban forest management plans. Um, but nevertheless, I think this is a really useful graphic and understand the trajectory or the continuum um, of, of programs. And, um, you know, for anybody out there who wants to know more about this or talk more about this, um, I will be posting my contact info in just a moment here. Um, I'd like to wrap up here um, by posting some, some uh, great additional resources. Uh, you know, this is hardly an exhaustive list, 
But um, this, in my mind, provides a great starting point for a lot of you. Um, and it's, um, you know, the various groups here and organizations are each in their own way, provide a really great wealth of information to help you along your way. Um, you know, the New York, both New York State and New Jersey have great urban forestry programs um, designed to help their communities within their state and, you know, the, the surrounding states around them, you know, which is the region I work in and I'm most familiar with, um, I would say Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, Pennsylvania also have great resources available to you. Um, because I'm a New Yorker, I have to put in a shameless plug here for the New York State Urban Forestry Council. Great group of folks that I love working with and I'm happy to be a member of. Um, and the Arbor Day Foundation is also um, a, great, a great place to learn more. Um, so, you know, this, as we've said, this, this is being recorded, so um, don't feel like you have to rush to uh, write down these web addresses or anything. Simple searches will get you there, but you can also refer back to this. Um, so with that, I will um, end my talk here. Thank you all very much for spending uh, your time with me. And um, I think we, we have a few minutes here. I'd be happy to take any questions if, uh, if we have some. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yes, please uh, use the Q&A um, tab to um, put in any questions you have. I've got a couple that have um, come in. Um, have you seen any creative ways to help with tree care and planting in low income neighborhoods, particularly on private property? Tree removals can be very expensive. Uh, they, they can. Um, that's a tricky question, but um, you know, I think on private property, um, you know, I would look to some if your if your community has any um, you know nonprofits uh, available or um, you know certain resources like that. Um, that's a good question though, and I I, I think I'm going to have to um, spend some time thinking about that a little more because that that's a good question and an important issue for sure. Um, you know that type of work can be expensive. It's it's highly skilled work and often dangerous. Um, so. Yeah, it, it can be expensive work. Okay, um, just quickly here. Uh, the recording for this, um, we usually will have it up over the next uh, couple of days. Um, I'll post the link to where we're putting these online in the chat in just a moment. Um, we have another question. What are your feelings on volunteers performing inventories? Um. My feelings about volunteers performing inventories, I think, um, you know, there, there are certainly uh, appropriate applications for that. I mean, I would start by saying, you know, of course they need to be properly trained. Um, that said, I think there are, um, there are occasions where it's, it's certainly um, appropriate and the best way to encourage community engagement and, um, you know, get buy-in to a community's urban forestry program. You know, it, it's, it, it is, uh, I think there are some limitations to it, but that said, you know, I, I again think that, um, you know, I, I personally feel like it's, it's certainly um, appropriate to bring in volunteers for inventories under the right circumstances. It can be a real asset to um, getting an inventory done. Um. I'm not sure. Uh, we have a question here that says, is funding available? Question mark. I'm not sure if uh, there's any. Okay. I, I mean, I think 
the thing I would first point to is going to your state's um, urban forestry and community forestry group. Um, I'm most familiar with New York State and New Jersey, both of which who have really great teams of people working on those grant programs to help um, help communities get get their inventories or management plans, sometimes maintenance needs um, addressed because, you know, we understand that um, many, many municipalities are dealing with limited resources and um, they're just not always able to prioritize trees in the way that we would like them to. So yeah, I, I would direct them toward, um, at least as a starting point, their, their state urban and community forestry groups. Um, in the level two to three inventory, what are the priority proprietary software costs and what would they run and for what period? Um, you know, they, they vary uh, depending on the software you are purchasing um, and, you know, the, the, the tools that are included in it. Um, TreeKeeper, which is Davies proprietary software, is a subscription-based software um, and you know, it, it's the cost will depend on, on how many years you subscribe to it. Um, and, um, you know, any, any sort of additional services or support you may buy. Um, but, uh, you know, they, uh, I think for up to a, a three year subscription, um, you know, you're looking at, at $10,000 and then on down for, um, you know, shorter subscriptions, uh, fewer, um, add-ons but uh, or support services um, but you know I'm most familiar with with that proprietary software and and it is um, in my opinion one of the most powerful and and the best and most user-friendly tool out there um, and and I say that not just because I'm a Davy employee uh, but you know as a as a, I have used um, uh, at least two other uh, management tools and um, I do honestly find TreeKeeper to be personally my favorite one. Uh, so, yeah, but, uh, you know, if anybody is interested in, in more specific information, um, you know, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to talk about um, a solution that best fits your community. Uh so you spoke a lot about street tree inventorying and plans in this discussion, but the urban forest is far more than the street trees per the definition you gave at the beginning. Do you have any brief words you could give on say urban natural areas, uh, inventorying and plans? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I did um, focus um, a lot on street and park trees. Um, those are tend to be some of the more commonly inventory trees. But, um, you know, that said, our areas are critically important and, and vital pieces of, um, of an urban forest. Um, and there's a couple ways to go about that. You know, sometimes in, individual, in, inventorying individual trees within forested areas is um, difficult and, um, you know, comes with its own set of challenges. That said, there are certainly other um, approaches and tools to be used to understand um, what, you know, to establish a baseline. For example, um, doing uh, urban tree canopy assessments, um, you know, which, which is uh, remote based and gives, you know, can help build a picture that way. That's not to say that inventories can't be done in natural areas because I think there are, there are certain um, applications where it certainly is useful and appropriate. Um, and, and then, you know, I would also, um, to the point about the urban forest um, being comprised of much more than, than street and park trees, um, you know, that's absolutely true. It's, it's, when we're talking about a fully comprehensive definition of an urban forest, it is, um, as I mentioned in the beginning of my talk, it, it is a bucket of both public and private trees. And in many cases, um, private trees make up a significant proportion, if not the majority of the trees in a given urban forest. Um, so yeah, it's a fair point. Um, it's just, um, you know, we're not, they're not often inventorying 
full urban forest with an on the ground inventory. Um, you know, urban tree canopy assessments are typically a more appropriate tool to, um, to uh, address uh, the broader, broader, to get a picture of the broader urban forest. Um, do you know of any push for research studies to compare tree health in cities with and without urban forest management plans? Hmm. No, off the top of my head, I can't point to any studies. Um, you know, if anybody out there listening is aware of any off the top of their head, please put it in there. Um, that said, uh, I like that question and I like that idea. And, and now I want to look for those <laughs> studies. If there aren't any, um, if there are any scientists on here, um, it's just my idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, let me let me dig into that a little bit because that's a that's an interesting idea. Um, what is your suggestion for invasive species management and helping a community and local municipalities understand their risk of not managing invasives? Important question. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, it's difficult to give any real specific answers on that because the the severity of that risk varies pretty widely um, by community and by the invasive species we're talking about. Um, but we, you know, I think it's, it's easy to note that um, invasive species are an incredibly serious problem for many of us um, uh, around the world and most certainly here in the U.S. Um, but as far as addressing and managing them, you know, it's really species specific and, and, and um, really depends on the goals of the given community. So any plans to address those is going to be a very um, customized approach tailored to that community, to that invasive species. Um, but yeah, that's an important issue to raise. Um, yeah. Okay, I see uh, one last question here. Um, are there any free software available such as government sponsored software? Um, well, I should note that iTree is free, um, but you know, I do want to draw a distinction here. iTree is, is not a management tool. Um, it's, I think sometimes folks are under the impression that you can input your inventory and um, manage your urban forest in the way that I was talking about by outlining, you know, maintenance and tracking all that stuff. That's not really what that software is designed for. Um, it it is um, it is though I should have noted earlier a, a great free tool for analyzing your urban forest, understanding and quantifying the benefits that it provides. Um, but as far as management. Uh, software. I'm not aware of any free software. Um, you know, some municipalities have built their own in-house or e other entities have built their own in-house management software. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's, it's, you know, I wouldn't say that it's um, open to the public to use or free in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there, there are certain um, municipalities Usually it's larger ones with, with the more developed and, and um, well-funded um, program that have, have built their own management software. Okay, um, I'll just leave the Q&A open for another minute. Um, doesn't look like we have any more questions. <clears throat> um, I'd like to thank Andrew so much for uh, doing this and um, that was a great presentation. Um, like we said, the recording will be available. Um, we usually have them up in a, a couple of days turnaround time. Um, I posted the link, I'll post it again to where you can find those. Um, and Andrew provided his contact information. If there are any further questions, um, you can contact him. Um, and then I'd like to remind everyone about the uh, upcoming um, webinars uh, next week with uh, Andrew Hellman of Davy Resource Group. He will be going over uh, covering the topic of growing big trees in the city and then the following week 
we have um, urban tree pests and diseases being covered by uh, Dan Gilrain of Cornell Cooperative Extension, Suffolk County, and Marjorie Daugherty of uh, Cornell University. If there are any questions, um, you can reach out to me directly. I'll provide my email in the chat. Um, and if you haven't still provided your ISA uh, number, um, please do so in the chat. We'll leave that up for a few minutes.